All right, now it's time for the big jump in Calc 3, where we start going from the applied to the theoretical. So we're going to introduce the concept of triple integrals. So first thing I want to do is discuss what got us here. So it all started with the definite integral. The definite integral said, let's take an interval from A to B and a function of one variable, and let's turn this into an area. So take one function, take one integral, you have a two-dimensional quantity. Then we upped it to the double integral. The double integral said, take the double integral over a domain D of a function of two variables, take one function, integrate it twice, you wind up with something three-dimensional. That would be considered a volume. <clears throat> so if we were to consider a triple integral, first off, a single integral needed a function of one variable, a double integral needed a function of two variables, which means that if we're going to consider a triple integral, we would need to have a function of three variables. And we'll go on to define what dv is in just a moment. Now, this is one function that we then integrate three times, which is going to give us a four-dimensional quantity. That four-dimensional quantity is known as hypervolume. Basically, take anything in three dimensions and add a dimension to it. You can add the prefix hyper to it. So hypervolumes, hypercubes, hyperspheres, those are all things that exist within four dimensions. But here's how it gets started. First thing we're going to do is define a box. A box is going to be what you get when you take three closed intervals, one for each of our variables, x, y, and z, and put them all together. So this will be the set of all ordered triples, x, y, z, such that x is between a and b, y is between c and d, and we're going to be running very low on letters during this, so we're going to say that Z is between R and S. The reason that we don't say E and F is because those are going to have different meanings later on. So this is a box. This is what you get when you take an interval along the x-axis, an interval along the y-axis, and an interval along the z-axis, and you put them all together in the same spot. So it's going to be kind of difficult to put together exactly what's going on in terms of sizes and dimensions here. But I'm going to do my best to help you visualize what's going on. So this box is going to be a little bit see-through. The important thing is we can project this thing back to the x-axis and have an interval from A to B. We can project it back to the y-axis and have an interval from C to D. And we can project this back to the z-axis and have an interval from r to s. So hopefully that makes sense when it's drawn in such a way. <clears throat> now, similar to what we did for the definite integral as well as the double integral, we are going to break the closed interval from a to b into, let's say, uh, l intervals, or L sub-intervals of length delta x being equal to b minus a all over L. We are then going to break the closed interval from c to d into m sub-intervals And the length of these is going to be delta y, which will be equal to d minus c all over m. And finally, we are going to break the closed interval from r to s into a total of n subintervals of length, that'll be delta z, which will be equal to s minus r all over n. So what we just did 
is this breaks B, our box, into, oh boy, this will be uh, L times M times N, love this term, sub boxes of volume delta V. And delta V is going to be equal to the product of delta X times delta Y times delta Z, which is pretty typical for a box. You multiply its length by its width by its height, and there you go. So, essentially what's going on is we are splitting this up into a bunch of sub-boxes. You could think of it as like how it might look if you were to slice a three-dimensional cake. Get a lot of cross-sections in both dimensions, or I suppose all three dimensions. I'm sure that there are some much better pictures of this in the book, but the idea is... Uh, we're essentially cubing this whole thing. And by cubing, I mean like dicing, like you would do with a chef's knife or something like that. So similar to what we did for both the definite integral as well as the double integral, we are going to select a representative point. From each sub box. Now, we are going to need a total of three indices for each of these. The typical notation that we've used is x star, as well as y star, as well as z star. But I want to make sure that we have room for three different indices. We'll call them i for x, j for y, and k for the z direction. Now, given that these are changing from box to box, even as some of these variables stay consistent, we still need three indices for all of them. Once we plug this into the function, we will have a function value that will be known as f of x sub ijk star, y sub ijk star, and z sub ijk star. So essentially what we have here is uh, if we were to compare this to the definite integral, plugging this into the function would be giving a height to a sample rectangle that we're creating. If we did this for a double integral, this would be giving us a height for the um, sub-rectangle that we were using and calculating a volume. Here it's a little more confusing because we're going to multiply by the volume of the sub-box. And what this does is it approximates the hypervolume associated with this subbox, the four-dimensional quantity that we're calculating here. So this approximates a hypervolume for just that subbox. To approximate the total hypervolume, we need to sum over all of these. Now we have three different indices, which means that we are going to need a, oh, this is going to be fun, triple summation. That triple summation is eventually going to turn into a triple integral as soon as we allow some variables to go toward infinity, which hopefully by this point in your calculus career is not really a surprise that a summation becomes an integral. Now the index i that was for x, so I will go from 1 to L. J is for y, so that will go from 1 to m. And k is for z, and that will go from 1 to n. Then to get the best possible hypervolume in all of this, we are going to let L, m, and n all go to infinity. So what we wind up with is the total hypervolume is equal to the limit as L m and n all go to infinity of the triple summation that we just set up f of x sub i j k star y sub i j k star z sub i j k star times delta v this is defined as the triple integral over the box B 
of f of x, y, z dv. So this is the triple integral over a box. This is analogous to a double integral over a rectangle. Now, when we started talking about double integrals over general regions, we had type 1 and type 2 regions, depending on whether x was a function of y or y was a function of x. Here, we're going to have three different types, whether z is a function of x and y, y is a function of x and z, or x is a function of y and z, but let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. So again, this represents a hypervolume, which is why we use capital H to describe it. And if you take a look at all of the letters that we've used in here, there are really not a whole lot of letters left at this point. Now, essentially, the way that we're going to be treating a triple integral when we get to actually evaluating them is treating it as an iterated integral. We'll be integrating with respect to one variable while treating the other two as a constant. Then we'll have a resulting double integral. So essentially, when it comes to evaluating these things, a triple integral is going to be an iterated integral followed by a double integral. Now, a double integral, though, to be fair, was just an iterated integral followed by a definite integral. So, well, let's do the math on this. A triple integral is just going to be an integral followed by an integral followed by an integral and I don't think I've said anything today that has made more sense than that. Triple integral is three integrals. Yeah.